It was last summer, and Marjorie Jean Aurelius, David Jean's granddaughter, was celebrating her third birthday. Mm -hmm. And we were down in the park, the service park. And I don't know how many of you have noticed, there's an eight-foot slab of limestone dedicated 1965 to the history of the Niagara Escarpment and the work of Professor Robert Clapp. Now, we know the people who are working to get the, geo, the DC Geo Center across the street mm -hmm. started. And I saw this <coughs> and did a quick search and it was a professor of geography for the University of Chicago. Well, obviously, he studied the Niagara Escarpment. So I told the people in the DC, GODC, and hey, this is great, look at this and everything. Um, and then I found out I didn't have anything to do with the Escarpment. Um, you'll see his article here where he mentions it, where he calls it a cruesta. But he was not a physical geographer. He was a human geographer. He studied humans' relations to the surface of the earth, to geography. Not, you know, fifth grade where you colored the Rocky Mountains red. Okay, so that wasn't him. Did anyone here actually know Robert Platt, Professor Platt? Nancy, Kurtz, anyone else? The family came up here for years. They still have a cottage um, down Door, Door County Bluff, a couple down from Harvey. You look at the sign, Private Road, it has the names. His name is on it. Um, I asked his, his daughter, is Nancy Rayfield. She's in her 90s, sharp as could be. She was up here in June. She's been very helpful for me in this presentation. Okay, I don't get it. Why are they talking about the experiment of Professor Platt if he didn't have anything to do with it? He said, well, they had some money to put up some monument to the escarpment, and they had some money to put up a memorial for Professor Platt, but they didn't have enough money to, for either one to complete their project. So they took apples and oranges and, and you know, made a salad. So even though they had nothing to do with each other, it's an impressive piece of, really impressive piece of work. You will see in your handout, it says a detail of regional geography, Ellison Bay Community as an Industrial Organism by Robert S. Platt. And it's an astonishing article. If you read through it, it was, it is Ellison Bay in 1926, but it's pretty much anything you'd want to know about Ellison Bay as a community in 1926. I mean, it's 44 pages. And if you look at these charts and the numbers and stuff, it's astonishing. He came up with a herd of graduate students. Um, and did this study, which resulted in this paper. Now, strange to see, there's a lot of different kinds of geography, different theories of geography. Um, Platt was an exponent of what they call regional geography. You pick a region, case of Ellison Bay, a micro region, and you study that to death. Or the opposite is what's called systemic geography. That's where you would take one item, corn production, okay, and study it system-wide, in other words, around the world. And Flat was very much a regional geographer. He said, we're going to take one area, and we're going to, we can't study everything, so we're going to identify our topics, and then we're going to be incredibly thorough in exploring those areas. So, he shows up in Ellison Bay with his graduate students. Uh, this, by the way, see, one, one problem with region, not, a challenge in regional geography is you've got to define the region. Okay. 
But you can't define the region and go do the study. You do the study and the results of the study determine the region. So you have to go beyond your region to find out the limit. Now, in the case of this study in Ellison Bay, you had Gilsrock, you had Newport, you had Raleigh's Bay, and the ever-present <coughs> Sister Bay. So he did all these studies and the interviews about where the central community was, and ended up drawing the boundaries. It was pretty easy with Newport, because there wasn't all that much going on. It was kind of a challenge with Sister Bay, because there was a great deal going on. Uh, there wasn't much in Guild Rock, so he came with Ellison Bay, and it's roughly a three and a half mile radius. That's <coughs> what he studied to death. Question, why <coughs> Ellison Bay? I mean, we love Ellison Bay. But if all of the little regions, all of the little villages, all the little communities in the world, why would you pick Ellison Bay? If you have a summer cottage there and you want to enjoy yourself, bring your graduate students with you. <laughs> Simply put. Well, that's, these are the graduate students. Now, we'll get to this in a second. But what got you to Ellison Bay of all of the places you can go to buy your cottage to bring your graduate student? Okay. If you go to Jens Jensen's biography, it lists all of the landscaping projects that they have figured out that Jens, that was Jens' work. Including in 1924, the Robert S. Platt House in Chicago. Now, nobody's definitively said, okay, Jen's got him up here, but I'll bet big money that's exactly what happened. Because Jen's retired from the Park District in 1919 and acquired, started coming up here in 1920, bought his property up there in 1920. Platt ends up right next to him. Um, no, that's not a coincidence. Jen's got him up here. And once he got up here, he loved it so much, he bought property and stayed. But for probably 10 years, they, didn't, they, they just camped out. They didn't have a, uh, a permanent resident. They were just camping on, on the beach. Now, this is the, this is the class of graduates. Now, does anybody, this is 1926. Does anybody notice something really, I don't want to say odd, distinctive, different, what you would not expect for a class of graduate geography PhD candidates in 1926? Women. A lot of women. women. A lot of women. A lot of women. I, I'll give you one, two, three, four, five. Anyway, a majority, a majority of women. <coughs> They're really nestled up there, so. <laughs> so, you know, that says a lot about Platt. And another thing about Platt, to give you an idea of what kind of a person he was. Um, they had this big house on the south side of Chicago. It's about two and a half miles from the University of Chicago campus. Big, big house. There's some money floating around in that family. Yeah. I asked Nancy Rayfield, and she was, well, they were silversmiths or something. But anyway, yeah, he, he, he gets appointed, I think, in 1921, 20, and in 1922, he's buying this huge house. Well, they had all these graduate students from around the world, the international students come in, and they, many of them stayed in the Platt house. They, they were called platiches. And as Nancy said, you know, it's like the, they didn't have a United Nations, but if they had one, that's what it was like. You had all these students speaking all these languages from all these countries, running all over the place, but that was Professor Platt. You get the feeling how much he just really was so warm and so human and related so well <coughs> with other people. 
uh, a little bit on the background. He was born in Columbus, Ohio. Went to Yale. I believe he's a philosophy major. Might have been a lit major, beside the point. He was a Phi Beta Kappa. Graduated in 1914. And Yale had their Year in China program. So, they, first they go to Scandinavia. He graduates in the spring. They go to Scandinavia, they spend some time, then they're going to take the, the Trans-Siberian Railroad all the way to China. What got in the way? Oh, yeah. World War I. Absolutely. So he gets to uh, Russia, and they, well, this guy might, he could be, might be a spy, so they interned him for quite a while, and they decided he wasn't, so they shipped him off to China. And he had not studied geography at all. So they had him teach high school geography. And one thing he did was important was he take the students out in the field and do field study. And if you look at the rest of his work, field studies were always a key component of an essential part of what he did. You know, that's what he did up here, field study. So he gets back to the United States. He decides he wants to be a geographer. So he enrolls in the University of Chicago, gets a PhD, gets on the faculty, uh, and the rest is all history. His, if you read this article, now there's three handouts, and we're only really going to talk about it, the detail in regional geography. So you have determinism in geography and a, a piece that was published soon after he died uh, that talks about his life. We're not going to cover them today. They are on the midterm. You're warned. Um, so you need to take them home and study them. But if you look at the back, and it starts just on these back pages, and you know it lists the papers he published, but it shows where the places he went. He went everywhere. He was in the Middle East. He was in Central Asia. He was in Europe. He was all over South America. He was all over Central America. He was in Bermuda. He was in Ellison Bay. He followed the escarpment through, through Michigan um, and, and did these little regional studies as he went along. But one trip, Nancy telling us about, they went down to Brazil. He did a lot of work in Brazil. Flew the entire length of the Amazon River crossed into Peru, started coming up on the Pacific side. Meanwhile, Nancy, who was under 10 years old, they, they have the kids go down to Miami, and they get on the Yankee Clipper, the airplane boat that Pan Am ran. It was the first Caribbean run of that, of that, um, of that route, and they get on, and the guy said, uh, this is your captain, uh, Charles Lindbergh. Uh, we'll be taking off and flying to Havana. And then they went to Jamaica, and they went to Venezuela. And, and imagine a child, you know, it ends up in, in Panama, then they take the boat, they end up in San Francisco. 20,000 mile trip. Okay, but it, I, I don't know if it was longer this trip, but if you look at those places he went, it's just amazing. They say he was fundamentally an explorer, and he was. I mean, he just obviously had a tremendous interest in, in, in people. He, he didn't study rocks or, you know, formation, people. Um, so the graduate students hit the beach next. Went door to door, interviewed everybody, literally everybody. This is Platt out in the field, always, always well dressed, always in suit, always in tie. This is Platt doing uh, mapping work next. And this is this is Nancy. She's now 92, something like that. Still comes up here, sharp as could be. These photographs, by the way, that you're seeing. The archives 
Uh, the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, have, they claim, 34,000 photographs taking, taken by Robert Platt. He took 20,000, 20,000 photographs, or 10,000. All right, I exaggerate. He took only 10,000 photographs on that trip when they're flying up the Amazon. Okay. And almost a great deal of them are digitized and could be accessed online by anybody. Do a Google search, Robert Platt archives UMW, then you'll get a master do an advanced search for Ellison Bay, pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of these incredible photographs. Now, these are students, and, and they studied the way I did. I mean, you learn a lot that way. You know, it's called dream work. Next. Grand view. I mean, that's what it looked like in 1926. Um, much, much like we did today, it, it struck me as, you know, very, what do you see on the coastline between Harvey's Dock and the town? The Randolph Cottage. So I don't know when it was built, but it was, the, it, it remains the predominant structure on, on that part of the bay. And we'll, we'll start now, let's talk a little bit about the, 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 the study. And you have that, um, a detail of regional geography. As we said, regional geography is a major branch of geography. It focuses on the interaction of different cultural and natural geo factors in a specific land or landscape, while its counterpart systematic systemic geography concentrates on a specific geo factor on the global level. We talked about that. So he picks Ellison Bay. Um, the study's not comprehensive. It's Ellison Bay as an industrial organism. Um, so he wants to, you know, the community of Ellison Bay. What is the community? How far does it reach? When does it reach the next, um, <coughs> you know, the next region, micro-region. Um, so he says, well, it's about 100 people. Uh, it's kind of, it's, there's some good farmland. A lot of it's crummy. Uh, we'll get into the numbers, but the way the Mink River estuary cuts in, it, it, everything gets, you, you can't get to Newport or anything else without going through Ellison Bay. So, you know, he talks about that quite a bit. He talks about there's basically three roads. There's the road from the south, the road going north, the branches, which I assume he means Garrett Bay Road, and what is now 42, and the road into town from uh, uh, Mink River Road. So he says these are these three major roads. They're not paved. Um, this was could have been taken standing on the porch of Rutgers, and this is looking south. As you can see, this is coming into town, and I'm guessing from the perspective, it would be on what's now Mink River Road. You know, he talks about, um, there was also the dot, there was the water transportation, the land transportation. You know, transportation is very important to the existence of the Ellison Bay community and what made it a community. Uh, You look on page 86 of your study, uh, you're going to see a description of the, the different buildings. We're going to break down what kind they are when they're built. Uh, dwelling houses, there was a nurse, there was a notary, there was a barber, there was a cobbler. Two retired farmers, a retired innkeeper, a retired sea captain, and three widows. <laughs> and his kind of his point, his essence is life of the village is in the activities of the village institution. Yeah. This is Mrs. Iggy's house. Now, I, the sign says Hillside Hotel, like that away. Um, That's it. Bar? Yeah. Is that it? That's the original one, yeah. Is this the hotel or what? Yes. So yeah, there, was a, there was a bar on the first floor and the hotel's on the second floor. Huh. 
Because the building, whoever built it, it looks a lot like Rutgers, except it doesn't have the on it. Well, my great grandparents had it first. Well, not first. They bought it from Refile in um, 18. Well, my great grandmother in 1881. Yeah. yeah, it did. Yeah. And in the report, they emphasize in transportation, you have the water connection. Um, mail mail boat came in once a week or, and took mail up to to Washington Island. You had you had. You know what is now 42 um, unpaved roads. They call the Peninsula Highway back then. They was there was talk of building a rail extension to Sturgeon Bay. Um, never panned out because the economics weren't there. I was kind of interesting to read that a lot of the shipping that came out of uh, Ellison Bay went to Menominee instead of Green Bay, because strong, good harbor, strong rail link, rail links, and it was closer. So the boat would go, you know, Green Bay, Sturgeon Bay, Menominee, uh, Ellison Bay, and then came back. But uh, Menominee, you know, had a surprisingly large amount of the, the shipping, which I really kind of surprised me. So, as we said, Ellison Bay, because of the Mink River estuary, was a choke point. You had to go through Ellison Bay. And, you know, Platt said that was to its advantage. That helped Ellison Bay and its businesses. It brought people in who might go elsewhere. Um, there was a daily mail delivery by truck. Um, there was, you know, the post office, so I don't know when the rural was rural delivery or it was delivery to the post office, and then you went and got your mail, and one of those things. Except in the winter, they did it by sled. Um, there were daily trips to the cheese factory, and we'll talk a little more about the cheese factory, but uh, Ellison Bay had one, and they were critically important because they didn't have refrigeration for milk, and, you know, it doesn't do very well <coughs> unrefrigerated. So they had to do something with it and something with it fast. So they'd line up 7 o'clock every morning and drop off the milk, and then they process it into um, cheese and whey and uh, byproducts, and eventually into butter, which turned out to be more profitable. And there were cheese factories there was one in Ellison Bay, there was one in Raleigh's Bay, there was one in Newport, and it was simply a matter of distance. You took it to the one that was closest to your farm. Um, and they, you know, obviously they eventually went, they had cold storage in Sister Bay and they, 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 they went, but it was a big industry in the, in the 20s. Here it's lifeblood. You got a big boat over there, and that's a boat, big boat over here, and one in the background. And Nancy Kurtz is Nancy. Right here. Right Your there. grand? Who built the dock? Uh, my great great grandfather supposedly did. It's in the advocate that he did, but I don't, you know, his Chris Brooker. Yeah. And his son Charles was the one who had the store, so Charles needed a dock for supplies. Where is this dock? It's this a Bayview dock right now. City dock? Okay. But it was the town dock and steamers, big steamers came in. Nancy, mm -hmm. is it the This is the Bayview, Bayview dock. or the Bay Cedar City? Grove, yeah. the Cedar Grove. Bayview. Not the Heritage Harbor, just their dock that they have behind mm -hmm. uh, at the resort. Mm -hmm. It was the original it was the town dock originally. And the fishing boats going out every day, coming in, bringing in their catch. But that's not a fishing boat. But it's a nice boat. Uh, we'll, we'll get down to those later. We had a threshing service. Um, it was a guy the farmer would hire, and, and he'd go out and he'd thresh your, your field. Okay. There was a sawmill, and Sister Bay had a sawmill. But the difference is, the Ellison Bay sawmill, you brought your log to the sawmill, 
<coughs> and paid that person to turn it into lumber, you took your lumber home. Okay. It, wasn't a, it wasn't a lumber yard, as you understand it. They didn't have a commercial stock of lumber. It was a, it was a sawmill service only, whereas Sister Bay had a commercial lumber yard where you could go and buy lumber. Mm -hmm. This is... Well, you can see the church there, and a couple of the shanties. The granary, which later became Clarence Lynn's uh, fish net uh, okay. drying building. <coughs> this one? Yes. Yeah. And that's Wills Park right there. Uh, yeah, it's yes. now Wills Park, you're right. I remember as a kid, I mean, I, I would go down and and Clarence would be fixing his nets and I'd be bothering him. And he was really nice. <coughs> and that's our barn, which right I never on. got to see. That's gone before I was born. All right, fast rule with Clarence Land at 350, the world stopped. Because he had to go home and watch Bandstand. <laughs> no matter what he was doing, 350 in the truck home watching Bandstand. Just some really, you know, fascinating numbers. First of all, shipments out of Ellison Bay. In other words, how are you going to make your money? You know, what was involved? Uh, number one was cherries at 20,000, fresh fish at 18,500, apples at 14,500, um, 1.2 million pounds. Um, Cheese, 12, 8. Eggs, well, you can see the numbers there. A million pounds of potatoes. It only brought in $8,000. But that's a lot of potatoes. <coughs> that's a lot of money. And, and yeah, it's, it's a lot of money. Um, and it was a cooperative effort in that they had, they, there was a potato elevator somewhere where they harvest them and store them so they could ship them out. I mean, a million pounds, that's a lot of boatload. Um, and the Ellison Bay Potato Growers Association was like the largest civic organization in Ellison Bay. It had the most members. Um, so you can look at you know, the value of the crops here. And then if you look at the next one, inward flow, you know, what was the value of stuff coming into Ellison Bay? And you had, you know, groceries at 22,000 and all the candy at 6,000. Um, on and on and on and on and on with these numbers. Um, and I did the math and the outflow exceeds the inflow. <laughs> so in other words, Ellison Bay was a, a profit generating activity. I don't think you get those numbers today. Um, and you know one thing with unfortunate about this study is they didn't do another study you know 50 years later to compare the two and talk about why things changed. From the summer visitors point of view, the most peculiar advantage of Ellison Bay at present is perhaps not the scenery and climate, but its people and its unspoiled community life. 